gave me, you know, the obvious poor advice basically mm. about diet and what they recommend. I lost my whole colon. Oh, wow. Hello. Good morning. Today I'm talking to the wonderful Lee Kent Carnivore. I always want to say Carnivore Kent, but Kent's not your name. So <laughs> Harry was calling me as well. Yeah, it's funny. That. <laughs> uh, that's funny. But is Kent where you live? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, a lot of people call me Kent. So we don't have many Kents around here as far as names go. It's oh, okay. Name in America. Um, but yeah, this is Kent. So this is the area, um, county of Kent. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I get confused. But Lee, my friend Lee. Uh, okay. So Lee, why don't we just get right into it? So at this point, um, and I'm not trying to make light of it, by the way, uh, but you've lost your entire colon at this point. Yes. Yeah. Eight years ago, basically, I lost my whole colon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, can we just like back up and like go to the beginning of the story? Like how did that progress and how did that happen? Because you're quite young. Yeah. I mean, I'm 36 now, but when, okay. when, I, when I had my colon taken out, yeah, I was I was young. You know, most people in their late 20s, they have their colon. So that was pretty unfortunate. But yeah, and this really all starts in 2012. So um, I had some nasty symptoms with blood and things like that when I wiped to go into the toilet. And so I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty strange bit worrying and so went down to the GP and then we basically went about going and getting my diagnosis which involved being referred to the hospital and having a bit of an exploratory with a probing device where they take biopsies while they're also having mm. a look around with the camera and yeah. that came back confirmation yeah you've got ulcerative colitis so it's an inflammatory mm. bowel disease that exclusively affects the colon um, where Crohn's disease which is very common affects anywhere from gum to bum so that's that's the difference there Mm. Um, and so in the beginning it was very low end and very mild and I didn't require any medication it was just kind of like this is what you've got and then they gave me you know the obvious poor advice basically mm. about diet and what they recommend what did they recommend they just recommended that I eat more whole grains increased fiber you know make sure you're eating whole foods this kind of stuff more just plant plant consumption that's what was advocated Hmm. so that's kind of what I did you know um two years of doing this didn't make any difference if anything it got worse because by the time 2014 came along I'm back at the doctors saying like it's definitely worse you know I, I don't feel like I'm managing very well and then that's when they they put me on my first dose of medications and I can never remember the idea uh, the um, name of the actual medication they gave me but it's all kind of like steroid type medication very hmm. toxic and inflammatory right uh, so when you first start taking these things it's like a miracle you know you think oh wow that's amazing my symptoms are like like at least 50 percent gone kind of thing mm. uh, but it wasn't treating root cause i wasn't getting any better mm -hmm. it just felt that way um in the beginning yeah well anyway so for the next three years i was going to continue to take their advice with the diet and taking the medication which i did and even though I did this in 2017, I was having a really, really bad flare. Like I almost knew that it was the last flare. Oh, wow. It was going to go one way or the other. Yeah. Um, so I was quite used to going to the toilet during a flare up, you know, anywhere from seven to kind of 15 times on a really bad day. That's crazy. Uh, it's crazy. That's... Yeah. It's almost oh, wow. like from feeling like a normal person the day before and you come out of remission, you start to flare and you just feel like, you've got something wrong that your body's trying to flush out and you're going to the toilet constantly and it's a little oh, bit wow. like, no, yeah, but there's always blood and it's, it's just <gasps> nasty. Yeah. So it's, it's not, you don't feel very healthy. It, it doesn't feel like your situation's even acceptable on a normal level, you know, Yeah. Uh, quite debilitating. You can't, you lose your confidence. You don't really want to just go out and travel up to London and spend the day up there. You know, you, mm -hmm. you really don't know where you stand with things. And typically these flares would last, you know, a couple of weeks, three, three weeks. And then oh, no. and yeah, yeah. And then you just feel like a normal person again. They, the, they go, you go back into remission and then just feel like a normal person. So the nature of this, these kind of conditions, they're quite pernicious because they gradually become very harmful without, you mm -hmm. know, every time you flare, it's like, wow, it's that much worse. It's that much worse. And um, this last time in 2017, when it flared, it was so bad. I was going to the toilet 30 times a day. And so I was just pretty much laying on the couch by the time I got comfy. I was getting signals to go straight up to the toilet. By the time I would wrap up up there and come back down again, get comfy, I was getting the signal to go back. And that, that mm. just continued um, 30 times a day for two days straight. And I ended up calling my nan because I wasn't driving at the time. Said, mm -hmm. you know, Chris, I really think I need to go to the hospital tomorrow. I'm not sure I've got another day in me to do this again. Mm -hmm. And she said, absolutely, we'll take you up tomorrow. 
um, in the morning. It was a horrible car journey there because I'm like grabbing. Oh, onto the yeah, it was horrible. Oh uh, man, trying not to, you know, have an yeah. accident. Um, ended up in the A and E and sitting there waiting. Everyone else kind of looks way more calm and they're not sweating. I'm just sitting there sure. like, like, please, I want to be seen. Um, and eventually, I was seen. Very dehydrated. They kind of hooked me up with the intravenous um, electrolytes and things like that. Mm-hmm steroids in the system straight away to try and reduce that inflammation so they can kind of explore again and see what's going on turns out from the point that they'd last seen me where it was very low end um just the very bottom kind of thing some disease there quite mild now it's just severe all the way up to the top Mm -hmm. and so my colon was just riddled now with colitis and um yeah they were pretty shocked you know because again i did take the anesthetic i could see all their faces and their reactions as they were looking around oh no yeah yeah (laughs) Bit strange it's almost like i don't know it's like they, they forgot that i was awake or something you know oh no it was terrible yeah. bedside manner yeah oh wow okay these guys are kind of freaking out so maybe i should be freaking out too you know so, <laughs> yeah um yeah so in, anyway I, I, I wasn't going home you know i was kind of like you're staying with us we're going to try and yeah. get on top of this they trialed me on different steroids which again they're like a miracle when you're on them um you, you go from 30 times a day all the way down to five times a day on steroids and they take the steroids out of your system, bang, 20, day, 20 mm-hmm. times a day the very next day, and then straight back to 30 odd times again. So then they put me on back on steroids again. And then they were talking about um, a auto, no, what is it, immune suppressant drug, sorry, which gave around about 50% chance that I would get into remission, go home, and then be on medications to try and manage the, the dis- mm. condition. Um, anyway, they trialed me on this for, I think it was like four days, but I should have only been on it for two or something like that. Um, after four days, I said, it's not worked in the morning. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take the colon out. So that's oh how, it happened. yeah, um, I had a stoma nurse come round, and the stoma is basically the, the last part of your digestive tract that, that you have that now protrudes through the abdominal wall that you'd fashion a bag over. That's your stoma, that little bit of tissue. Um, and so these stoma nurses, um, they came round and they drew a circle on my stomach. That's where the stoma was going to be. Just talk me through how it all works and this kind of thing. And so, and actually, at the time, I was just kind of like, yep, just do it. You know, I'm up, just do it. I'm bring it. I'm fine. I, I, I don't want to feel like this anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the situation. And the next morning, I kind of went down to the surgery. And next moment, I woke, wake up and it's all done, just in a bit of pain and discomfort. And slowly but surely, kind of uh, got back to health to the point where I was independent to take care of the bag. And because at first they were like changing it and putting it yeah. on and all this kind of stuff. And um, by the time I could stand upright, wash and, and prove, you know, I can do this myself, then they were happy. They sent me home after about 12 days. Um, and then that's when life kind of hit me really hard, actually, is when mm-hmm. I got home in the hospital. Uh, there was something about the environment there. Just the nurses coming in, paying you visits during the night. No one's judging you in a in a negative fashion. And you feel somewhat normal because you're in that place. You're in the right place with, you know, I'm not. I'm not optimally healthy right now, but I'm here in the hospital and everybody else is treating me like a normal human. I feel fine, you know, but by the time I got home, it was like I was instantly depressed. I think the Mm. moment that next day came, um, I was at my mum and dad's house at the time. They went to work. My brother went to work. Now I'm just on my own in the house and instantly just depression hit me. I wasn't happy with things, my life, the way it looked and felt and lost confidence and just kind of was in my head, living my life in my head, constantly berating myself and putting myself mm. down and things like that. Mm-hmm. So it was quite tricky at first. I was trying to figure out what to wear so people can't see that I've got this strange thing on my mm-hmm. stomach. All this kind of stuff, it affected my sleep because sure. I felt really restricted. Um, and so that that also didn't help, you know, like when you're not sleeping right, that doesn't help your mental state. No. And so everything just kind of manifested and... Um, It wasn't actually until a few years later, you know, when I was really, really hitting rock bottom and I was like, I need to reach out to somebody Mm -hmm. because I don't feel like I can continue to manage my life on my own. Right. Um, And so that's what I did. And actually what happened after an extensive conversation over the phone with people that were going to refine how they were going to treat me, potentially therapy and maybe a course of medications, which I didn't really want. Mm -hmm. uh, they never got back to me. And so I felt quite good initially after this conversation, just sharing sure. your troubles with someone that you've never met and you don't even know what they look like. Right. By the time a couple of weeks went by, I was like, this, they're not getting back, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm either going to have to get the ball rolling again, which for, for whatever reason I didn't. 
Um, and I was just sitting down watching YouTube and that's when I saw Michaela Peterson's anecdote that just kind of planted a, a seed in such a way that I just, I was really impatient. I just wanted to try this thing because she was talking sure. about her carnivore diet being obviously a very restricted lion diet. Um, but she meaningfully addressed her depression, arthritis, all these autoimmune conditions. And, you know, I had an autoimmune condition and I was severely depressed. And so I was like, well, what have I got to lose? So I, I spoke to my partner, Lucy, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. And she was like, okay, well, we can do it together if you want. So we, we just jumped all into the BBBE challenge. So beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And after about three weeks of doing this, though the first two weeks were really hard, energy mm -hmm. was low. Um, I was very tired. I felt weak. I was losing weight quite quickly and I didn't really need to. Mm -hmm. uh, after three weeks, like everything turned around and all of a sudden I had loads of energy and I was smiling. And I pulled out, I was like, I'm not depressed anymore. I recorded on my phone this whole mm -hmm. testimony. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it, you know? I, I think so, I've seen that. I think I've seen that. Yeah, or I've yes. seen many. So I don't know if I saw that one specifically. <laughs> That's how I got on to Carnivore anyway. And so that is strange because I wound up finding the diet that would have addressed my original problem, which mm -hmm. led to being depressed. But obviously it's never too late. And now I'm no longer depressed anymore. And so life's good again. So okay. it basically just enabled me to have a better outlook, um, coping and not reacting mm -hmm. so much and uh, anger levels. So that they, I wasn't really angry or reactive like I was before. Um, everything started to improve. And so I've not looked back. You know, this was originally a 30 day challenge and now it's almost my two year anniversary. So wow, a week or less, actually, maybe four days or something like that. Um, I'll be two years carnival. I've not really deviated at all. So. Um, that's, that's, awesome. that's the whole sort of uh, beginning, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, up to then my, my last surgery. So the last surgery, unfortunately, was just to address what had been on the cards for all of those years to just remove the very last bit of tissue at the back end that they left there as an option for reverse. So mm -hmm. usually they leave, you know, they take out what they have to take out and leave what they can in order to mm -hmm. potentially fix it back together with an interior pouch so you can kind of oh okay somewhat of a more normal life again but yeah it's obviously not the same you know so a lot of people as i looked at the statistics and things and i, I was look, pouring myself into looking at all these blogs and so many people were like don't get the reverse or mm. some people would have great success you know but i think the percentages were something like 30 percent have to go immediately back to this because it just doesn't take another 30 mm. percent um they they have like a worse life outcome with the way they're living with the internal pouch okay then i think there was like another 30 percent that were only just slightly improved but did have some problems and there was like 10 percent that were like yeah i'm really glad i had it done and so um and bearing in mind the tissue that i had left was five centimeters connected to the anus so rectum was like basically five centimeters and then mm. the anus where 80 percent of people in my position had um i think it was 10 centimeters or more mm. so they had more options they, it's easier to perform different surgeries because you, you've got more to play with. So it was strongly advised that I didn't go for the reverse and looking at like, you know, the, the blogs and the percentages, I was like, I don't think I'm, I'm going to seek the reverse. I'm, I'm kind of just got to make my peace with this. And uh, mm -hmm. that's fine. And, you know, because of carnival, I was like, well, that's fine. You know, that's okay. I don't feel so bad now. Right. And, and so, yeah, it was just about getting the ball rolling again to get this surgery done. Um, so in my head, I thought it's just going to be a quick keyhole. We've only got to remove five centimeters of tissue. I'll be in and out and that, that'll be that. But because it was so small, it really dangerously encroached on the nerve tissues that connect <gasps> to the bladder and kidney function. And so they were then explaining to me that unfortunately it's not just a proctectomy, but you have to give you a laparotomy as well. So they would have to go through the, the old scar tissue at the front again, um, so that they can put stents in, which were horrible. Um, the stents mm. from my, in both ureters, kidney and bladder to get that kind of out of the way so that they sure. can attack the area more safely. Yeah. And How so, long were you in the hospital for after this? So that was a 10 day. So I beat my last one by two days, but, th but this oh, was okay. worse, like in terms of pain. In terms <gasps> of, I mean, the incision, like the first incision must have been maybe like seven inches or something mm -hmm. like that to take mm -hmm. my colon out. But this yeah. incision, they went maybe an inch and a half lower to where they had already cut before all the way down to you know what <laughs> all the way down to the bottom mm. now i've got like i don't know 11 inches of just scar tissue it's a really mm. crazy 
you know, cut. Is it healing like rapidly? Oh, it's, it's healed great. It's, it, oh, yeah, okay. it's amazing in the hospital. Everyone was like, oh, wow, it's that's really healthy. Like, you know, it looks really good. Like it healed amazingly fast. That's awesome. So, so much so that I didn't really even feel there was a problem there. Everyone okay. was talking about, you know, take it easy when you lift, take it easy when you drive, yeah. take it easy, you know, listen, listen. I was thinking like, don't worry, it's fine. I feel great. You know, I could pretty yeah. much move around and, and do all sorts like, after a few days of having the surgery, the problems really came from like the stents in my mm -hmm. ureters, which gave my body perhaps the impression that there was kidney stones and that, that they were trying to flush these things out. And the pain Ooh. that was associated with that, oh, yeah, it was really, um, I've not known pain like that. And I've experienced a fair amount of pain, you know, in the first surgery and symptoms building up to that point. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, it was strange. Like, it's amazing when you start feeling pains in places you've not, really felt anything because you're not aware mm -hmm. of your kidneys unless there's a problem you shouldn't be aware of your heart unless there's a problem you shouldn't be aware of anything until there's right. a problem. and often even with things like cancer it can be really really bad and you don't feel anything whatsoever right and so it's interesting when you start feeling these internal pains that are just so excruciating that i don't know let's put it this way <laughs> um i was wearing this funny gown and i'm quite a private person right but i was wearing right. this gown, and so if i just stood up and it's undone at the back you see everything I'm in so much pain that I spent most of my time just bent over, like over a pillow, people walking oh, in, wow. seeing absolutely everything. I was in so much pain. It's like I just didn't have the ability to even consider other people or anything, you know? Oh, my gosh. That it was. And yeah. So for a, the first week, it was like hell. Um, and the second week was better, but, you know, lots of pain and, and discomfort. And it wasn't until everything was removed. So the sutures, the staples, the oh. steps and the medication surprisingly it was only until i came off the medication that i stopped feeling pain oh so, that's interesting yeah um i was taking these medications even at home very sparingly just when when i would feel like a a bit of pain and it was like oh man i'm not gonna be able to sleep like this so i'd take the i'd take the, the medication and it's like i'm now re i'm on the floor again oh know? man that's crazy maybe you were having a reaction to the medication yeah i think because a lot of this stuff it's interesting a lot of this stuff that helps kidneys damages kidneys you know, and a lot of the stuff that we take for pain will damage your kidney, like paracetamols destroy your kidneys, for example. And so a lot of this stuff that we take for the pain that's in my kidney is damaging mm -hmm. the kidney. And I wonder right. whether that had to do with it. Um, Phil, es Phil Escott in the UK here, I don't know if you know Phil Escott, we do lives occasionally. He recommended mm -hmm. that I try some d -manos. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, okay. It's like a amino acid, right? Yeah, it's like a sugar. It's like a natural sugar. Which oh, is okay. like anti carnival, but he was like, honestly, try this because he had great <laughs> success with his kidney um, stones. I think he had, um, and a lot of women say that it really helps with them with certain, like, I think that's like a compound that's in cranberries. I think for but, like, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, that's what that is. Yeah, so, um, anyway, this was just to help with kind of maybe like flushing out things and, and helping the body. I don't know, anyway, I, I haven't really even looked into this that much, but I started <laughs> to take this and I stopped taking the other med medications and all this kind of stuff and my yeah. body just up really really quickly um but of course when i was in the hospital i had this horrible menu with the typical standard diet here oh but, man um yeah the choice were the opposite you know you, you just mm -hmm. can't make it up like they, they didn't even try to disguise what the spread was they just called it polyunsaturated spread <laughs> a healthy choice next to it yeah and then they're like healthy brown choice food. yeah healthy choice orange juice, healthy choice, you know, fructose and deuterium in a, in a glass. And it, it, it's just crazy. Like the whole grain sure. bread, healthy, sure. you know, so basically they wanted me to have some whole grain bread spreads, polyunsaturated bread on it and, and wash it down with orange juice. And it's like, where are all the essential nutrients? What, mm -hmm. how is that a healthy choice? And then you've got like the, the red meat on there. That's basically mixed with mashed potato and different mm -hmm. things, gravy, and it's processed and there's loads of sugar in there. And that, even though it's obviously not healthy because of all the other stuff, that was the the poor choice. That the stuff with meat, butter was the poor choice. Eggs were the poor choice. Um, it's so crazy. So yeah, it? it's absolutely madness. And so to stay on track, obviously, I wasn't going to touch that stuff. Mm -hmm. My mum, Lucy, and my mum and dad actually mostly they brought me in everything, all the food, and so I started with both. Oh, that's awesome. And then I had a boiled egg, I think, and then it was chicken. I was just craving chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that m must have to do with the whole, you know, my skin wants to heal and I want the raw materials to try and 
Mm -hmm. address that and i think you've got all like the connective tissues the glycine the collagen the, all this stuff that you can eat when you eat chicken right um and so i was getting a lot of that in my system but uh um i eventually got around to red meat but yeah i think that's why i healed so well my skin um mm -hmm. yeah just looked very very healthy and didn't have any problems you know uh, and did the doctors did they or nurses did they notice you weren't eating your food that they were bringing and you were bringing other eating other food did they have any correlation that that might be why you're healing <laughs> well they if anything they kind of probably thought it was the other way around like well look that's why he's here i think that that's what they were thinking more so <sighs> yeah i mean my surgeon i had a phone call with my surgeon because i had four pre-operation assessments to set me up for surgery and every time mm -hmm. they were canceled so it was like well for the fourth time it actually happened right so i had three cancellations and then the fourth time it happened, he had a phone call with me and I was in the van at the time, just parked outside. And he was like, so you won't take the ensure shake before the surgery. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. So that's toxic. Like you want me to fast. And but then right before the surgery, you want to pour seed oils and sugar down my neck. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And he was like, oh, but you need your energy. I was like, I have energy. I'm, I'm on a ketogenic diet. I have fat on me. I'm going to be fine. You know, I'll probably be eating like four or five days later anyway. And he's like, okay, well, as long as you know, make sure you nourish yourself, eat really well up until the surgery, Lee. I'm thinking, yeah, I will. Yeah, I will eat meat. I will eat <laughs> eggs and eat butter <laughs> and this kind of stuff. He said to me, um, do you think this is just in your head? Do you think this is in your head? Like, like all this stuff? Because I was saying, I'm allergic to plants. When they were talking about in the pre-op assessments, <laughs> one of the questions is your allergies. And I said, all plants. I, so I just said, all plants. Yeah. Um, and so, and this wasn't with him. This is with, you know, just a, a nurse that's, you know, sorting me out to, to eventually see the surgeon but dr bailey he, he was only really talking to me right before the surgery i barely yeah. saw, i didn't even see him you know before, oh, I, wow. out before I saw him and then when sure. i woke up he was gone again it's like you don't really mm -hmm. see the surgeon very much oh interesting yeah but um every time i did see him he was he was definitely skeptical he doesn't under, and it just show, it goes to show that these guys don't understand what food is what food isn't what mm -hmm. they're recommending is toxic um when I was trying to get this whole surgery going again, I was explaining that I still had to sit on the toilet. You know, I don't want to offend anyone, but and a lot of people don't realize this, but I've had my colon taken out all this time. And I, it's redundant back there. But because that I had five centimeters of tissue that connects to the rectum, it wasn't completely sealed off, you know, at the back mm. of the very last part. And so my body was still producing fluid and stuff that every now and again I had to sit on the toilet. Okay. And he was going to prescribe me steroids just to address that and to things, you know, things to stick up there and to address that. And it's like, is this going to make anything better? And he said, no. I was like, well, I don't want them there. <laughs> Why would I take this yeah. stuff, this toxic sure. person, put it in my body every day so that I can, I don't know, not have to sit on the toilet every now and again. I mean, it's I'd rather just sit on the toilet every now and again. Sure. You know, it's not addressing the problem. Um, so I was just waiting to have this thing removed. And obviously I had it removed. And um, it's strange because I think that they could see I was recovering really fast and I was doing really well. I was walking on day one. I walked 20 hours after I had the surgery done. So oh, everything wow. they cut like sort of, I don't know, like nine inches probably of, of incision. And then 20 hours later after being sewed back up, I was walking and going to the toilet unassisted because they had the catheter taken out. Because mm -hmm. uh, I was oh, talking. Oh, that's great. About, yeah, yeah. Um, but again, I, don't, I mean, who? I don't know. I can't imagine I would have been able to do that last time. Sure. And I was there for 12 days when I was in less pain and it was a smaller incision. Mm -hmm. Things have kind of really, really rapidly healed this time. I mean, I was, I went to work, I think it was five weeks and three days or five weeks and four days. So five, yeah. five and a half weeks when my recovery was three months. And bearing in mind, you know, my job is quite physical. So I'm in the car driving and then I occasionally get ladders off. I'm reaching and cleaning windows and things like this. Every now and again, jumping over a gate. And I was doing this at five and a half weeks and there's no way. Oh, there wow. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sure. So it's amazing that the moment I got all the things that they put in my body, including the medications and pain relief out, my body healed really fast. And again, it just goes to show when you eat proper food and you live the way you're supposed to live, why right. wouldn't your body heal fast? Right. You know, so it just makes sense. It totally makes sense. Wow, that's so crazy. I'm so sorry that you lost it, but I'm happy that you're on the other side and you can potentially help other people who Definitely. don't have that don't have to get their colon taken out if they eat the right food starting from the like when these symptoms start yeah yeah and again yeah. it's like the opposite of what we've been told so 
the things that they say will exacerbate your symptoms are the things that are really non-inflammatory that will allow your body to be nourished and heal at the same time. Right. So, Were you told once to drink beer? <laughs> yeah, that was like one of the first things. The guy suggested beer. I think this the was doctor? a doctor. Yeah. One of the doctors said, what you want to do is drink a beer a night. Um, his thinking behind that is that uh, he would, I would be able to maintain a regular bowel movement, you know, because oh, of all the, and the body and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you'd think he would even say like non-alcoholic beer if he's going to recommend me drink a beer at night. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, 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 right. Crazy. You can't make it up. Like, why would that help? Why would that help a problem? I've got ulcers in my in my colon. Right. Yeah, have some alcohol. That will help. I mean, it strips the lining of your colon. It doesn't that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And this is a professional doctor who gets paid very well. And his position is really he, he's a teacher. He he's supposed to think and teach and guide. Right. Where he's just so irresponsible. The other totally. guy recommended fiber. Um, and then it was obviously steroids. All of this stuff isn't going to help improve your symptoms and, and, and get you out of trouble. It's leading you towards, you know, deeper, deeper water. It's, it's not a good idea. And these guys, we trust these guys. And mm -hmm. I trusted them at the time, which is why, you know, again, why I set on my channel because I thought, well, I've had amazing results. So I, I want to share this. But right. you know, in terms of addressing depression mm -hmm. and mental health, but also mm -hmm. I'm now becoming aware of the fact that this exact diet that treated my depression was also the diet that treats absolutely everything else. We're, we're, we're humans, so we need to eat what humans are supposed to eat. We're not right. supposed to eat things that we're, our body's not designed to accommodate, you know, and, and indigestible fiber was definitely one of those materials in plants that exacerbated my symptoms that caused my depression. Um, sorry, that oh. caused my IBD to worsen mm -hmm. to the point mm -hmm. where I lost my colon. Um, mm -hmm. I've recently realized the... Um, importance of well plant proteins you know that they not it's not important that we consume it's important that we don't consume them you know because these proteins for the same reason this fiber is such an issue they're not digested properly and so it's kind of the same common theme with all of these things seed oils again so if you eat meat we break it down entirely we absorb it entirely and yeah. it's not inflammatory there's no there's not a lot to get rid of but when you consume fiber by definition, it's indigestible. It's the, the indigestible carbohydrate portion of that plant. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the organisms and the equipment to actually break it down properly. And right. So, Can I ask, uh, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Because yeah. you can actually, I mean, honestly, I could see my, my indigestible salads in my toilet. But yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, since you have this bag, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of it again. The sto me bag or stoma bag. Yeah, yeah, it's a bag. Stoma yeah. bag, okay. When, <laughs> yeah, when, before you start a carnivore diet, could you see undigested food in there? And what's the difference now? Like, what's the difference with your poop? I know it's kind of a yeah, gross yeah. Know, conversation, fine, but... So, yeah, huge difference. And and the funny thing is, is that when I got home and I was um, obviously now with my bag, I was looking forward to getting back to normal food, food that I have been previously enjoyed because obviously I've only had hospital food. I, I remember thinking I can't wait for my first burger and chips, burger and fries, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, love it. And so, um, yeah, and... And so I just went straight back to eating the way I was, which is kind of strange because you think, well, why have I not questioned even myself? I've not really thoroughly questioned why have I wound up in this situation to begin with? It must have something to do with the food. I mean, I'm, it's my digestive tract that's suffering in the colon. Yeah. Food and the digestion, like they go hand in hand, right? And I didn't really question it meaningfully. And so I got back to eating the, the same old foods. Um, and so what I was noticing for the first time is something that I never would have even thought that when you eat plants, whether it's a mango or seeds and nuts and things like that, or just like potato starch, that stuff, however you finish chewing it, that is exactly how it goes into the bag. And so, wow. Yeah, That's exactly. Crazy. It, doesn't, it, it doesn't change whatsoever. And so obviously if you swallow little sunflower seeds, they won't break down. The sunflower seeds are in, intact in the bag. If I've kind of chowed down on a bit of pizza and there's a chunk of mushroom on there and I've kind of like just – you know, liberally eating it and just swallowed it, yeah. not it thoroughly. There's that big chunk of mushroom intact in the bag. Um, and that goes for all plants, right? So even though mushrooms don't contain fiber like other plants, all plant material and things like that, the fungi, they they all don't break down. So I was seeing, yeah, all this strange stuff. And I remember even <laughs> at the time, it's funny to talk about, but it'd be like, Lucy, look, look at this. What is, how is that? You know, it was, <laughs> it was kind of like, no way. How is that yeah. tapped like that? And I hadn't really questioned either that 
why is there no meat? There's no meat. There's no bacon. There's no steak. Mm. You know, I, I could have a kebab and have like a lamb kebab. All that mm. lamb, red meat, where is it? It's, it's, it's liquid. And so what I've come to understand is that the stomach acid, you know, in humans is very low pH, so very, very acidic. Mm -hmm. and that is designed to strip flesh down to a liquid, which it does very, very easily and effectively. And that way, all of your food, all of those molecules, the proteins, amino acids, etc., everything's liberated, it's liquidized, it's now non-inflammatory in your mm -hmm. digest digestive tract. So you're absorbing the nutrients in your small intestine. You're not destroying the microvilli that are responsible for pulling in those nutrients and which indigestible fiber, the indigestible plant protein seed oils will damage. Um, and then obviously when it gets in the colon, the water's reabsorbed. And so why, when people were like, well, I don't see what you see. Mm. And I didn't either when I had my colon, but the reason sure. why is because the liquid is now reabsorbed. So even if you've got a chunk of mango that's pre-digested or not digested, it's now going to hit your colon that way. Cause I've seen mm. it as it would hit the colon. That's where my bag begins. Okay. Now the water's being taken out. It's kind of like, like vacuum like sucking all the juice out of it. So if you've got tomatoes in it, it's just going to be the skin that's kind of like just crushed and it's condensed. You've got to think okay. it's now in your colon and being condensed. Mm. Color change, it's all going to be brown. You're not going to see the red tomato and the, right. the mango. And it's not going to be so large because the water is slowly but surely being sucked out of it, reabsorbed. Oh, wow. So, I will say, though, I see if I eat like before, if I would eat corn, I would see it in the toilet. Yeah. Uh, undigested uh lettuce and i'm not sure i had gut issues i don't know i yeah. i didn't get to any point where you were at but i would definitely have gut issues and um it's not a competition <laughs> yeah it's not a competition i'm just saying like i've seen undigested food that my body obviously is like get this out of my body get this the corn, like yeah the corn and the peas it's a bit of a cliche isn't it yeah uh, so even sometimes, lettuce sometimes though lettuce exactly yeah, yeah. nuts yeah. nuts for sure Exactly. I think those things, obviously, you, you can't like suck like the water and reabsorb the water out of the arm and say, for example, that now the arm <laughs> won't be there. But I think where it's condensed, you don't see as much detail and you won't see it to the extent that I did. Mm, yeah. Like, you'll see them every now and again, but they're kind of hidden. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely things like corn and peas. I wonder if it's to do with the size as well. Yeah. But literally everything that I consumed plant wise was the same. And I've even kind of just for a laugh done like experiments, you know. You just take like yeah. a bit of pineapple and you just like cut shape out of it, just swallow it. And there it is in the exact same shape. And there's a bit of pineapple, a bit of mango, a bit of mushroom. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't change. And so if you think about the fact that someone with Crohn's, they've got, they've got a problem in their small intestine potentially further up than I did. And that stuff mm. is now flowing through mm. the, 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 you know, the small intestine. Often like, you know, sandpaper, you've got to think, the, the roughage that seeds, the nuts, the the grains and all this stuff, that's got to be really inflammatory, you know, right. on, on, and exacerbate those symptoms and make it worse. Mm -hmm. Where if you think that meat is now just a liquid, like that's that, that actually allows the gut to fix. You can fix leaky gut on a lion diet because yeah. it's broken down entirely in the stomach. Now you're just getting all the nutrients absorbed in the small right. intestine. Why? And now your gut is just, it's going to be happy, you know? And it's funny that they, they say, hey, if you want a healthy gut, eat lots of fiber, eat lots of plants, the stuff that doesn't break down. Right. You know? so again, it's the complete opposite. And and it's no wonder that my symptoms exacerbated that I ended up on a surgical table taking their advice because it was totally the wrong advice. It was the opposite of what I should have mm, done. I should have cut terrible. plants out and eaten mostly red meat, eggs. Right. Dairy is questionable, I suppose, you know, while you, you're in, in trouble. Do you think that, um, I hear you, by the way, do you think that if you – would have eaten that, like been on like a carnivore diet and a, like no plant diet that you would have saved your intestine, your colon? Yeah, yeah, I'm, oh, okay. I'm very, very confident. Yeah, it's only it's based on a number of things. I mean, obviously just my anecdotal evidence of what I've seen. And so straight away, I was thinking, oh wow, my poor colon, look what it was dealing with. I immediately understood that mm -hmm. because as it's going into the bag, this stuff is like, that's where I had my problem. So that's mm -hmm. one reason why, because I've now seen the difference between this plant material that's indigestible and inflammatory and now the meat that's just liquid and not non-inflammatory. Yeah. Um, but also people I've been in contact with and I've, I've been in contact with a lot of people. There's only one person that, that seems to be an exception. All of these other people with similar conditions, whether it's IBD with Crohn's or colitis or even diverticulitis, they all seem to say when I go on a lion diet for enough time, and usually it doesn't take that long, 
they they go into remission, they can cut back or come off entirely of the drugs that they're taking, and they're not having surgeries. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really confident that's the case. The exception I'm talking about is someone who I'm still in contact with on um, on WhatsApp. Actually, he lives in the states, I think Arizona, mm. and he's got the worst ulcerative colitis condition I've ever heard of. It's like he's oh, tried wow. it. He's gone to the desert and had sort of all these different experiences. Just try, honestly, that he's gone so far with I've tried everything that he's tried things that you would laugh at. Okay. Well, I won't laugh. I understand when you're in so no, much no, that's do how anything. He is. And, and yeah. he's almost never known remission. So I oh, can't, wow. I, yeah, I can't get my head around the fact that he's lived with this so in such a severe state and never really known remission. How are you still here, you know? Yeah. But I'm trying to get in contact with him. I have got some other information that may help. Which is, to do, so. which is to do with light, actually. And I'm not going to pretend to know all about it. <laughs> but, but the importance of light is way, way under uh, underrated, you know. Sure. There's there's the diet, the proper human diet, but there's the proper human lifestyle. And right. we've got to realize that, yes, we've, we've withdrawn ourselves from the natural foods that we would have access to um, all year round as well. But also right. we've, we've, we've kind of removed ourselves from our, our natural lifestyle. So rather than waking up with the sun and the birds and going down with the sun and the birds, eating during yeah. the daytime, not being exposed to EMFs and blue light, right. feet, like all these spectrums of light, sun, vitamin mm -hmm. D and stuff. We're now kind of cooped up inside. Some people like will get up when it's still dark and, and then just enter a building where they're just sitting at a computer all day. Other right. people get a day off, they lay in and now they're getting up at like midday and then they don't even go, you know, or they do go outside and it's like the morning's midday, you know, and, and so the yeah. light information that the body's receiving is totally wrong. The circadian rhythm is totally out of whack, which means their endocrine systems aren't functioning the way they should because all your hormones are, a lot of it's governed by light. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that. Mm -hmm. uh, blood pressure being where it should be, your blood glucose being where it should be, all to, a lot of it's to do with light. It's so, so interesting. Yeah, and you've got these receptors in the eyes and on your belly, believe it or not, POMC, it's like a gene. And they kind of, when you, if you were to just get up with the sunrise and look towards the east and have your belly out, um, there's a lot of benefits from just having the sun as it rises and that morning at AM light, hit your belly, hit your eyes. That's going to give you like, it's like cheating. It's like a cheat in life. Oh my honestly. God, I'm totally going to try that because we live on a private property. We used to live in a like an apartment, but we live on a private property. I could just totally just go out with the with the top on and show my belly and walk around because I wake up early. That's a benefit of the carnivore diet. I do wake up early. I try to go to sleep with my kids uh, like early, 730. It gets it it gets dark here at six and every day, six o'clock dark, six around there, six a.m. Yeah, light. Yeah. So if it's just the same as well, that's gonna make it super easy. I mean yeah. I, I started getting up with the sunrise and at first it was really difficult. Um and obviously now it's quite early, you know, I'm getting up at like, you know, quarter to five, five o'clock kind of thing. Oh, wow. Meaningful. I'm used to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a game changer, honestly. I mean, I, I, wow. the moment I go and just stand out and wait for that sun to come up, about 10, when, when the sun starts to come up, after about 10 minutes of just gazing towards the east, I feel amazing. Like 10 minutes later, it's like, I feel, it's wow. like a full dopamine kick. Yeah, it's really amazing. I'm going to uh, try that. Do you think it'll work? Because usually in the morning, it's either raining or overcast, and then yes, the, the yeah. fog comes in. Will Regardless it still work? The weather conditions are like, get yourself out at the time of the sunrise and just stand there with your bare feet grounded, if you can. If I can. Not, 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 not a worry. You know, the, the sunlight on its own will offer these benefits. It's going to allow your hormones to function, to to kind of kick in and to, to activate and deactivate at the right times, if you like. You know, okay. So it's just going to allow all these things to to function when they're supposed to and, and then and how much they're supposed to function you know and so oh, wow. I, I find myself naturally getting tired at, at a better time and and obviously it's not just about the sunlight you know you want to get out in the morning right. you want to get out in the in during midday it's just to help remind your body where you are what time it is and what's going oh, on oh so interesting yeah um, our bodies are really in tune with the planet if you do stuff with the planet <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> That's the reason why birds get up when birds do. Birds don't need to set an alarm. Birds yeah. aren't insomniacs, right? Unless you're an owl and they're not insomniacs, they're just nocturnal. But yeah. you don't have some birds that are kind of in the corner, like struggling to get up, and then they, they take the day off. <laughs> and they, they on a mental health day. Like they don't want to go and catch worms, you know? <laughs> sense. So yeah. like, all this stuff, if it doesn't make ancestral sense, it's like just throw it out. And so that's why animals, they're like robots almost. They, they function yeah. on 
a pilot. They don't make mistakes because nature doesn't make mistakes. And so when right. you align yourself with sun, the sun, circadian rhythm, everything is mapped out for you. Now you've got your routine. That's your routine mm -hmm. now. I mm -hmm. understand you've got these different jobs and some people might have a job where they can't witness the sunrise or they, they right. can struggle in the evenings, you know. But my, my advice would be when you can sunrise midday, when the sun's going down, also midday love, like like 12 midday yeah midday like oh. 12 when it's okay. kind of like highest pretty much in the okay. sky it's just a great it just basically grounds you like here here we are this is what time it is it's reminding your body to do what it's supposed to do and then when the sun goes down get yourself out there again and then when you come back inside dim the lights put blue blocking glasses on have the software on your mac or your your phone which mm -hmm. dims blue light and, and allows you to block that out sure you'll find yourself relaxing more you'll yawn, you feel tired, and it's the way it should be. You're not supposed to be kind of like hyperactive at 10 o'clock at night, just answering emails on your phone. Oh, that's me know. sometimes also. If I'm not like, sleeping, that's me. <laughs> if you're doing that, you know, yeah. if you've got glasses and you've dimmed that screen, you've got like a bit of software that blocks that blue light out. Mm. You're, it's a game changer. It's, it's going to be oh, wow. advantageous for you and your health. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you've got that kind of routine, you can't, you can't deviate just fine tune it like like there's hacks you know what i mean there's yeah hacks. yeah and so um that that really helps and yeah like you know even recently i've been a little bit later to bed um i've been extra busy like struggling to get a project project up in a day and i want to get up that day and it's like 10 15 i'm just about getting the project up and i'm on my screen and oh crap i put my blue blocking glasses on it happens you know we're not perfect sure sure but, uh, it's definitely a game changer and for people with gut health for some people it's not until they've practiced this kind of stuff with the light um, that their, their gut finally fixes. And so that's why mm. I want to get in contact with this guy again. I think he's in Arizona to talk about. He's got thing. a lot of light in Arizona. It's very hot yeah. and sunny yeah. there. And if it's, <laughs> if it's light a lot and cold, that's really, yeah. really good as well because cold exposure is you know, sure. super healthy as well. Because we're sure. not supposed to, again, it's getting back to nat nature and being natural. We're not right. supposed to be adapted to the warm. Like, oh, I'm cold, turn the heating on, put a cardigan on. <laughs> cold, less adapted to the cold. That's right. what you're supposed to do. You can't right. just stick the heating on when you're in the wild. You, no, how many yeah. layers have you got? Where's your wardrobe with all these layers, you know? Yeah. Or you so, have like, you have a fire going or something. And <laughs> I was just thinking like, my daughter is six. My son is seven. And I fall asleep with them all the time. This is, moms will understand this. I fall asleep with them all the time. Now, if I have something scheduled on YouTube, obviously not, but um and I think that's also like very natural to like fall asleep with your kids. There's some sort of thing there. Yeah, even I bet like that's good for you as well. I think I, I think it must be. Just, Maybe it's it's not just, weird. Yeah, we have in our uh, now that everyone's gonna know how we sleep. We have two big beds on the floor in the room because because we bought them bunk beds. They wouldn't sleep in them. So there you go. <laughs> but like, <laughs> and and I think probably when we lived in caves, we were all sleeping together because it was freezing. <laughs> probably yeah. just the power of human touch you know that's been shown to be super beneficial right uh, hormones different dopamine just different things different signals things that go on mm -hmm. in the brain that's like magical miraculous all this stuff we're designed to touch each other yeah. and to love and to and to ground you know even touching mm -hmm. plants if you can just grab hold of plants with your hands it's all beneficial this stuff we did naturally all the time without thinking about it it's right and you know our going to work for the day would be right we need to hunt we need to hopefully catch something because this is what allows us to live tomorrow and the next day mm -hmm. sometimes they'll work a, a really long shift and not catch anything and so they're right. fast and that's also beneficial you know all of this stuff so we, we would be practicing all of this stuff on autopilot without even questioning it but sure. now in eternity you eat nothing but red meat you go out and you watch the sunrise and you with your bare feet and your belly out and and you wear these blue blocking glasses and everyone thinks you're a freak <laughs> <laughs> crazy strange guy that's like the tin foil hat guy that's just yeah you know, season all this kind of stuff when actually it's this is reality this you know we need right. to leave as much of our progress right. um, as possible because it's regress it's actually going against us right absolutely yeah we get into i wonder if a lot of depression has to do with the fact that people are eating the wrong foods they're poisoning their body they're uh they're not sleeping and then the food doesn't help you sleep it keeps you like anxious and then you're watching your screen all day. Yeah, yeah. I Absolutely. think I think those things, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just that's just normal life today. And right. You think kids that are born born these days that they don't know any different. They just they're born on like on a screen <laughs> straight away. Mm -hmm. They're on a screen. It's they're terrible. It's terrible. They're encouraged to be inside where it's safe and, and right. Oh man, 
Yeah. As a mom in this day and age, you, I don't know, maybe from bad teachings, you get a little scared. So I've had to like open my mind. So like in front of our house, uh, there's like a little hill and it's very steep. And I told my husband and there's no barrier from like going down the few stairs and then walking down the hill, uh, walking where the stairs are so you could fall down. <laughs> so I told my husband, put a rope there. And so I just, they just started climbing up the, not using the stairs and climbing up the rope to get to the three stairs to the front door. And I think that's very good because they're playing in nature. They're building, they're getting a strong body and yes. it calms my mind a little bit. I've had to like calm my mind to let them of fall course. down the stairs. That's, that's the key to good parenting. I'm pretty sure this is what Jordan Peterson says, but it's like yeah. the key to being a successful parent is learning how to back off slowly, slowly but surely as time goes on, because the more you coddle these, these kids, yeah. the more you're actually setting them up to fail. You know, right. it's a, a typical example, like my little, kids a little bit you know it doesn't feel great i want to take the day off can i take the day off sure you stay with me yeah inside this little box where we're safe it's like but if that you keep doing that it's right. the opposite of safe sure, sure. Kids nope. that, you know that, that lose confidence they don't know how to socialize they're not being socialized properly right behind, they, they, they get cast aside and now you're always cooped up now you don't have your confidence you don't know to talk to people so you're the only way you communicate is like playing games and you're talking to someone from china and you're playing a, a game at 3 a.m yeah or something yeah. and it's like you're that's dangerous that's dangerous right there sure. not, not going out and watching the sunrise and being active in nature and getting sure. dirty in the mud you know oh up, yeah we, there's a, a, a football field right over here football soccer like soccer football <laughs> over here <laughs> and um it gets very muddy and it's fine we last week two weeks ago we were just sitting down playing in the mud <laughs> yeah and, that's, that's good for us it's great. And I loved it. And I'm 40 years old and I'm playing in the mud. I'm like, but I got a little angry when I got mud flung at me, but still. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just really good. It's all good. All that stuff. Now we don't even want a cold shower, do we? It's like, it's too cold. Like, oh, the, man. There is no hot water in nature unless you're kind of near a volcanic area, you know? Right. Hot yeah, spring, that's true. Lake water, seawater, it's cold. That stuff's yes. cold. We went fishing in that water. We we cleaned in that water. We drank mm -hmm. that, that water. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're so withdrawn. It's just unbelievable. It's it is. I I made a video and nobody watched it, so I'll say it here. I just say like go outside and <laughs> only a few people watched it. Um, go outside and like say hi to people that you've never met before and say hello and smile at them. Um, it's very much a part of the Colombian culture to say hello to people walking down the street, and we need to get back to that. That's also nature. Like communication is life, and if we are stuck, we're not communicating. Uh, Oh, look, you're on Facebook. You're not really communicating. You're you're commenting. That's not real communication. No, it's changed the way we we feel we can communicate as well because we're behind the screen. Right. We say things we wouldn't ever think of saying to someone in real life. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Like something yeah. <laughs> in a good and bad way, I guess, you know, it right. changes the whole spectrum of this. But yeah, there's nothing sure. wrong with that. And yeah, it's about getting back, to, getting back to nature. But over here, I'd say because I live in the countryside, because it's not like the city life where uh, okay, you might not see the same face more than yeah. once. Yeah. Oh, okay. You are more inclined to say morning or hey, okay. hi, if you're walking your dog or you know, I don't have a pet, but like often people, you know, they're just very friendly. They'll they'll say hi. It's a little bit more old fashioned. But what yeah. I have noticed, you go to like London for the day or something like that, and it's just like. I don't care about anyone like right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, you're all of you got the earbuds in, right? And you're looking at your phone just so yeah, you I'm don't like, actually have to confront a single person. Yeah, <laughs> out of my way. Everyone's just like me, me, me. Yeah, it's just strange. But I, yeah. I guess it's just the conditions in which you know we li we live in. It, it shapes right. us. And right. So um, being sort of more of the countryside here, I could probably connect with you a little bit more with that lifestyle over in. Sure. Uh, yeah. Is that is that quite? Um, would you say that's because of the the environment as well, where you see people quite frequently, the same people? Um, no, because all right, so we live in a private property. There are in this little like village walk, so it's only cars. I do see um, some neighbors that live up the hill this way that have to walk up the hill to get to their house from the main road because there's just a main road that goes to the city below and the city above. Um, okay. No, it's very much a part of the Colombian culture to just be kind. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's known the happiest that apparently this is that I've read that this is the happiest country in South America and people oh, are just or friendliest. People are very friendly here. And that I think that's helped me a lot. I love that. I love that culture. I, I feel like I've become part of it, even though I'm, 
I'm definitely the gringa. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice actually. It's very valuable. Yeah. It's rewarding, isn't it? Yeah. You know, to, to say hi and say hi and just to be nice, like to not just be, to be nice. rush and hurry and be impatient with people. Like you're right. in my way and everyone's in a hurry anyway in the car, you know. Like, oh yeah. It's just the, and- the nature being in this vessel that can travel at such high speed everyone's even more impatient for getting to places faster it's like you're already getting to a from a to b super fast now you've got a car but it's not yeah. even fast enough for you when it used to be when we used to walk we never used right. to moan like, oh it's gonna you know i've got to walk like that's just how we travel but now sure. we jump on planes trains and all sorts of things and we're, we're more impatient than ever so it just goes yes. to and it's like all this stuff that we do is regress it's it's progress right it's so interesting that you say that because I think like I, my kids have flown a couple of times. They are extremely impatient on a flight, <laughs> but we yeah. can walk. And sometimes they get impatient if we go on these long hikes, but no, on a flight, they're like, are we there yet? I'm like, we literally just took off <laughs> almost <laughs> like we got four hours left. Four ways to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a to B <laughs> is a long journey. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I just want to say, cause we've been talking for a while and we took up some other stuff that I didn't intend to, but I'm really happy we did because I think these are important subjects. Like let's go back to being nice to people. Let's go back to looking at somebody and saying hi. And I think like if you actually stop somebody that's like, and say hi to somebody that is not here, like, is there in there wherever, like, don't talk to me. You might actually cheer them up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's possible. Sometimes you do. Sometimes it has the opposite effect. I mean, some people, <laughs> you like wait this guy this random guy just said hi to me yeah you know, it just happened it's like well that shouldn't be that way you know yeah Go we gotta to retrain say, hi. yeah exactly <laughs> we gotta retrain people to just be friendly and help each other not everybody for sure there are some people that are just kind of mean but most yeah. people are not and they want love and they want that human connection that in this day and age might be missing a little bit <laughs> so us people are they're, you know they're looking down on their phones while they walk aren't they they wouldn't even oh know yeah them accidentally walking into like poles and stuff and then <laughs> so, you've got these, these, pe- sorry, yeah. then you've got these people that try and do like they try and sure. juggle they're like pushing a, a baby in a pram i don't know what you guys call pram i know it's not yeah no i understand uh, a baby bug i don't even remember because yeah. here in colombia it's coachy coche and in the u.s it's another word a stroller there you go a stroller. Oh, that's it, that's it, baby stroller. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, you know, these people like they're crossing the road yeah. lighting up a cigarette texting on their phone and pushing a baby in the stroller across the road it's like wow that that's that's the thing that's weird that's strange that's that's the thing we, we shouldn't be doing and it, like, on. i don't yeah. know if you do this but if you're in a car you just watch people driving on the opposite side of the road so yeah. many of them are on their phone oh you know no I mean? so yeah. many it's like, ugh, that's just what are you doing you know yeah that's Ooh. like that's a recipe for disaster right you're going there. from a to b super fast and you're so impatient that you need to respond to a comment while you're doing that yeah exactly oh my god let's like just calm down everybody let's just get back to what's natural as much as we can (laughs) you know yeah oh yeah oh my gosh i can't imagine i can't imagine going back to how i was eating before with that said i do eat stuff that's off so um i will say i tested doritos it used to be my favorite food doritos like one of my favorite things i love that and i tried them in january and it tasted like cardboard mixed with chemicals i bet i bet I don't know how I ate this before. How did I think that this tasted good? Yeah, it is inertia as well. It's that, that kind of programming and conditioning. It's like right. that, that chemical, that, that there are chemicals in there that, that just are addictive. They put them in there. Then mm. That's why they're so boorish. Yeah. But, uh, if I eat popcorn, I feel bad. But popcorn okay. is like definitely an addiction. I could literally down like three buckets of popcorn. If, right. if I decided to eat a little bit, three buckets are gone. That stuff's really bad for your gut because I've eaten popcorn with this bag and like, wow, you, you wouldn't believe that stuff doesn't break down whatsoever. I've seen it in my poop and I don't even have a bag. <laughs> yeah, that stuff's bad. I mean, I, I would definitely recommend not having, <laughs> having that, especially with yeah. IBD or whatever. But. Oh, yeah. I mean, I used to have gut issues. And I noticed one time when I ate that popcorn, um, I was like, I couldn't sleep that night. I could drink like a ton of coffee. I'm sitting here sipping on my coffee. If I have popcorn or a lot of carbohydrates, I've, I've messed up my sleep. Yeah, it shows you there's levels, isn't it? There's kind of yeah. levels to what what's okay, you know, every yeah. now and then sparingly in the diet. Every now and then sparingly, yeah, but popcorn yeah. probably never. <laughs> the only thing close to that that I can liken it to, you know, like your explanation of the Doritos, like tasting strange, is just smells now. So after being on this diet for so long, certain smells that I used to like, like yeah. a ready meal in the microwave, if someone's cooking a ready meal, I'm like, what, what is that? It smells so <laughs> 
it's not food, you know? No. Um, garlic, everyone smells of garlic now to me. It's really strange. It's like, wow, everyone oh, wow. Eats garlic. So, yeah, people smell different to me now. It's almost like, you know how everyone has a different culture, they have different foods, mm -hmm. then those things come out of their pores. Mm -hmm. It's because of plants are toxic and we, we, you know, the biggest organ on the body that we get rid of toxins through the skin. So right. alcohol, you smell alcohol on people, you smell garlic mm -hmm. on people. It's like, wow, everyone smells of garlic over here, you know? But it's almost oh, like wow. they're in a different country. Like I used to be one of them <laughs> and it's almost like now I'm Portuguese or something and I don't eat so much of that and now everybody smells strange, like I'm from a different right. country. That's kind that's, of how it is. That's uh, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, different foods, things that I used to like the smell of, it's kind of like, oh, what is that? someone likes a candle and, and my partner Lucy she'll try, she does like candles um but she'll try and like time it so <laughs> so I'm not in the house or something because often the things that even in candle I'm like what is that because I used yeah. to associate it with food like the sweetness and the fruit and different things that's right. food like mascarpone or almond all that stuff I used to love like marzipan oh yeah where now it's like what is that, that that's not food and so it's yeah. amazing that you 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 know, you withdraw yourself from that stuff and now you can reprogram. Right. And now that stuff's totally weird. The stuff that you used to just accept as normal is like sure. alien. Dare totally. Touch totally. And I think the other thing that's weird is that you get so in tune with your body before you're just like craving carbohydrates, carbohydrate addiction, yeah. uh, for me at least. Um, and oh. now I'm just so in tune with my body. Uh, I would, I got sick recently and then I, I didn't eat. And then all I wanted to eat was eggs. And then I just ate eggs. So something in the eggs, my body, yeah, my body needs some vitamin that was in the eggs. Yeah. Uh, and I eat eggs more than anything. So uh, recently. Right. Um, and so funny. you get really in tune with the nutrients your body actually needs, which you can't be if you're on like a standard Western diet. No, no. Very true. Yeah. It's just like too, way too many foods, even to understand what's causing you a problem as well. How do mm. I know what causes me a problem? I eat everything. <laughs> So that, right. No, right. One, you no idea. Mind diet to go right. Let's see what what is the problem. And people may start adding foods back in, and then realize, wow, almost everything causes me problems, other than the red meat and the animal. I product. I I think so. I think that the carnivore diet is like people say it's restrictive, but I take it in a good light. You're like you're not poisoning your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're. And I I actually think it's the opposite. Like I'm I'm liberated through. Mm. I, not restricted it's the opposite like i can sure. live my life now i can get on and do my work or i've got more time my outlook i've got new lenses you know everything yeah. looks better and well it's, it's it's hard to come and to accept some of the truths that you realize about what we've been lied about you know right those new lenses it's like good and bad at the same time but right for sure you know i, I couldn't recommend this more highly so. oh i love that and I'm so happy you're doing better. And I, every time I see you look healthier. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. No, that's the idea anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, you do. You look healthier. So, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, you're welcome. Do you want to say anything else before we uh, finish our little chat here? Um, I can't think of anything. Oh, when people okay. say this, I'm like, oh, I'll probably just come across super boring. Like, no, okay, that's it. We're done. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, think. well. Just give me a rundown of the five main foods that you eat right now. Oh, five. Do you know, I may I'm, I may not even eat five foods. Oh, uh, there you go. Tell me. <laughs> so I love beef. I love fatty okay. beef. Um, ribeyes, sirloins, short rib, oxtail, all that kind of stuff. So that's beef. Mm. Um, I rarely eat ground beef now. Well, okay. I make more of that in the beginning. Um, I do eat lamb, but I, I would say it's just like red meat category kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to try and hit five foods. So let's count that as two. Okay. The, okay. <laughs> Cow and lamb. I, I do like eggs, but I, do you know what I found recently? I don't have the whites and I don't cook them. So I, I just have raw egg yolks. That's basically oh, okay. What. So okay. often if the, the, the food isn't fatty enough, I'll either have butter, bone marrow or egg yolks. Hey, um, that's five. I, I think yeah. you got to five. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. That is basically, yeah, I don't eat a lot of organs because I never really crave organs. Again, in the beginning, I was trying bits like liver. I've had brain. I've had kidney. I've had mm -hmm. uh, spleen. I've had yeah, all sorts. Um, but now I don't really crave it, so I just don't. I just don't feel like I need to eat organs. But okay. Oh, I do eat, have fish as well. I do eat fish, mackerel. Okay. Um, I've got some raw. Um, sorry, I've got some monk fish liver in the fridge. Mm. That stuff is delicious. Monk fish it's liver. Great. I'm gonna have to see if Anyone I can find that. Order of monk fish liver. It's like fruity. If you like yeah. that kind of sweet. Oh, 
Yeah, it's not it's not going to taste fruity to the average sure. person. Okay, it taste, maybe it'll taste fruity to me. Exactly. Yeah. If you, if you've been on carnivore and you eat mostly red meat and you don't eat any sugary thing like yeah. dairy, like yeah. it's going to taste kind of sweet. Like liver can mm -hmm. taste kind of sweet. If you know, it's like yeah, I love chicken liver. I always say that. Yeah, when I, yeah. I'll shout out chicken liver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I chicken livers are actually really, really nice. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't eat raw chicken livers. I've eaten raw, um, like like beef liver and lamb liver and stuff like that. That that often tastes like apple and beetroot to me. Oh, interesting. I couldn't. I tried. It was very hard for me to swallow. I had to. I was doing a YouTube video actually, just to try it, like for a YouTube video, yeah. and uh, I, it was very hard for me to swallow. I had to do two rounds to get a little piece of beef liver down. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you let it sit for a few days, like even in the fridge, and smell it, it smells like chocolate. I don't mm, know if you. I think I'll, I'll try that. I'll go get some. We're going shopping today. I will. I will try that and let it sit in the fridge for a few days, and I'll. Especially if you let it ferment, even just for twenty four hours in a jar, and then just let it breathe, give it a smell. It smells like chocolate. Oh, wow. So it's it's got to be something to do with, like, I don't know, iron and vitamin C with whatever it is. In that. Oh, okay. Just all these fruit, like beetroot and apple. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just <laughs> nutrients or something. Oh, man. Kind of smell. Oh, you who know, knows? But yeah. So do you, you do you eat dairy or no? I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm funny, really, because because of the surgery that I just had, I wanted to prime. And it was strange, really, because I, I, I wanted to put on weight. And if I knew mm. that it was like coming up after my first assessment, I would have just drank some milk, gained some weight, primed. So then if I'm not going to eat for a week or something, I'm I'm going to feel pretty good. Yeah. Um, um, so I was kind of on and off milk because they kept cancelling. And so I'd kind, oh. of, kind of been on and off milk, but I've always made sure to drink under uh, like two glasses of milk. If that okay. Note. Yeah. I think that's okay. It's acceptable as long as you can moderate. Um, right. Obviously, there's a naturally occurring sugar. Sure. Um, lactose, but for people that, that don't understand how that works. Like you've got glucose, galactose, essentially all of it's metabolized as glucose. Some people liken the, um, sorry, the uh, galactose to be metabolized like fructose, which is super mm -hmm. damaging. And it's, that's actually not true. So oh, if you okay. milk, first of all, you're not consuming plant toxins. You're not consuming fructose. You're not consuming indigestible right. fiber. There's no lectins and anti-nutrients and estrogens and chemicals, none of that stuff. So, Yes, there's carbohydrate, but if you can keep it at a minimum, like the Maasai do, they drink a couple of glasses a day with blood. Yeah. They're, in, they're still in ketosis. They still mm -hmm. thrive. They're not inflaming themselves. Right. And obviously, if I was to have milk, the cows down the road here, they're grazing, eating the grass fed. Right. Um, so it's local. It's, it's, it, do you know what I mean? The information yeah. I'm giving my body, my body's not like, you know, it's like a mango from another country or a banana from another country and it's December. Yeah. You know what I mean? so yeah, exactly. What body's receiving isn't inflammatory, if, if we put it that way, you know. So sure. milk isn't half as bad as a lot of people think. But if you don't do well on dairy, you, you just obviously shouldn't touch any whatsoever. Sure. So super sure. sensitive people. Um, but I would, sorry, just additionally, if you're someone that's gone carnivore and you're having heart palpitations and like really racy heartbeat, Add a bit of dairy to your diet, and often that goes away. And so oh, that, interesting. that helps. yeah, that's. I might just, try that. I have that, but that's probably the coffee. <laughs> yeah, and also, yeah, that also happens. <laughs> Though, when I actually started drinking coffee in the beginning of my carnival diet, and I never oh. used to drink coffee before. Oh, very funny. I, I would get super shaky, like those yeah. kind of tremors. Where obviously now I'm like zero carb with the coffee, no tremors whatsoever. Hmm. And so I thought I had a caffeine issue, and it wasn't. It was the caffeine and the sugar in conjunction. Sure. So mm, that makes sure. it totally makes sense. Coffee. And I've had coffee with raw milk as well, and it mm. does not have the same. Um, I don't get the shivers as well, and the, the shake. Sorry, so there's something to be said for that. Sure, that's very interesting because I usually drink black coffee, and then my husband came in with like this fatty, creamy coffee yesterday. I had a sip, and it was like, whoa! It was the the intensity of the energy that it shot to my brain. It was probably the fatty cream mixed with a little bit <laughs> yeah. of the coffee. Yeah, okay. <laughs> people put like the the beta hydroxybutyrate in there and the MCT. The bullet the, coffee, bulletproof coffee. Oh, okay. Um, I don't I think know what the butyrate is. Is it just like another? Uh, it's a ketone. Oh, okay. It's the main ketone body, yeah. Uh, beta yeah. hydroxybutyrate. So when we're in ketosis, that's the main um, ketone body that's sort of circulating in our blood, kind of thing. And and that's actually so nourishing for our gut and our brain and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's why people almost like they want to increase, um, which is like, like some people supplement, you know, in addition sure. to carnivore and say that they get benefits. But yeah, a lot of people do these sort of bulletproof coffees, don't they? Yeah, they do. I, I like the black, maybe a little bit of cinnamon. 
Uh, but I like oh. eating butter. I've tried uh, MCT oil and it gave me the runs, but that was before I did carnivore. That's so probably, maybe, yeah, you're probably just not used to at that point, at least from metabolite, you know, taking on that much fat. Yeah, probably yeah. what happens. It was only, it was very little and it gave me some stomach issues, but it was during the time that I was having stomach issues. So I'm like, I'm not going to add something else. Maybe I'll try it again because yeah, two years later, a year and a half later or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I have one more question. It's very important. Did you kill the animal sitting behind you? Did you hunt it? <laughs> the animal, the, the antlers. <laughs> this was brought home from a trip that my mom and dad went on. I'm trying to think where they ended up now. I can't remember. It might have been Norway. But oh, wow. Yeah. Th these were brought home. So these are real. Um, the ones up there that I often stand behind that looks at, makes it look like they're coming out of my head, they're not real. Oh, um, okay. These, yeah, these, um, I'm trying to think. Pretty sure it was Norway, but they brought them back for me because I was kicking up the 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 house when we bought it. This was like five years ago. So this was before Carnival. Okay. I would make it look a little bit like um, a hunter's cabin with the wood and the pictures and the lakes and the horns and stuff. I just quite like that rustic, cozy yeah. look it and feel. Nice. So, yeah, so they're real, but I didn't kill I didn't kill that animal, no. <laughs> Somebody uh, did, but yeah. <laughs> I hopefully they ate it also. Hopefully they <laughs> They, they ate it. <laughs> I think they were worried about it getting back. Is it gonna? Is it gonna break and so? And the guy that sold it to him literally picked it up and said no and just whacked it on the floor really hard. And then they were like, okay, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> so, oh my god, uh, those are very strong. Yeah, very, very, very strong. Oh my goodness. Yeah, those ones up there are artificial. I just like that. This that. I'll have to look on your channel and find when you're like having horns coming out of your head. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. Oh, I love your little bear and your moose. Yeah, I, I sort of been a bit OTT and the, like the canoe paddle and the telescope. Everything's oh, okay. Cool. Um, well, not the outdoorsy. Telescope. Yeah, outdoorsy and the and the rug that we've got. It's all kind of rustic cabin look. So. Nice. I love that. I love cozy. Well, when I go to Kent, I'll have to come and visit one day. One day I'll go to the UK. This is our hobbit. To. It's what we call a hobbit house. It's absolutely tiny. <gasps> Honestly, it, it it probably looks a little bigger on the camera. Sure. It's, you walk in, and then you've probably got like. 12 steps until you hit the wall and that's it. And then you go upstairs. It's like three stories. <laughs> Where's your yeah. kitchen? Is it on the second floor? Wait, oh. the other oh, okay. way. Yeah. It's a tiny kitchen, tiny hob. <laughs> um, not a lot. Yeah. It's crazy. So really I'm interested in getting like um, a, a big green egg outside. Oh, okay. okay. Um, cooking my meat, you know, over fire. That would be nice. And just have a little, little oh, area yeah. to, to cooking my meat. Yeah. Nothing tastes better than meat over fire. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for talking to me. Okay, awesome. All right, well, that's been fun. It's been really fun and really nice to talk to you again. Yeah, you too.